think the specific details of how BOST operates or whether BOST is even a long-term solution is really what's important here. Um, I think this group are the, digi are the digital pioneers that invented something where nothing existed. So they pushed the idea forward. And looking at the framework that they've bootstrapped together, it's simple yet effective and highly adaptable. It allows them to continually rethink and redefine virtual response in an environment that is itself continually changing and evolving. As we think about the design of new solutions for emergency response in a digitally connected world, we should be moving towards solutions that possess these same qualities. So that's, uh, so that's the end of the first section. Um, and now I'd like to um, shift gears and talk about a portion of my current research that stems from, stems from my involvement with BOSS. And I'm going to start by giving you some background on my initial approach, what started as an, in, an initial collaborative pro, um, project, followed by my work on the Carlton Complex wildfire that made me rethink what I was doing and look at the problem a different way. Um, I'm going to talk about the analysis I did after Carlton that led me in a completely different direction. Um, and then I repeated that in 2015 repeated that analysis live in 2015 to evaluate it. And then I'm going to talk about where I am right now and where I think I'm going to go with it. So within Project EPIC, we have um, a fairly sophisticated data collection server um, and tools that allow us to capture social media conversations um, related to disaster events and, and topics of interest that we have. And uh, throughout my involvement with VOST, whenever I've worked on an activation, I've gathered data at the same time that I often use post-event for analysis. So um, I think in early 2014, I started using a tool called Tableau, which was, is an interactive visualization tool that made it easy to take the, the tweets that I was looking at and create information that I could then share with the boss. And my thinking was, there was an opportunity to hear, opportunity here to look at, could I use the aggregated Twitter information in a way that could provide new insights for the boss team? So that was where I started with that. And I tried it, I, I tried it out on multiple non-emergency events in the spring. And what I would do is, at the end of the day, I would extract the data, do some analysis, generate a summary report that I then handed off to the boss team leads um, so that they had that information going into their morning briefing the next day. So that was the idea. And I tried it on the USA Pro Challenge, a bike race. I tried it on the X Games in Aspen. And then uh, later that summer when Chris Erickson was going to fire in Washington State, she called me and asked for my help. And so she was, um, and I thought, okay, here's a great opportunity. I'm going to try this on a fire. Is that is that a fire jumper? No. No, that's uh, somebody on a snowboard. Oh, upside down snowboarder. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. They do crazy stuff on snowboards and snowmobiles. Sorry. And, yeah. So there you go. Um, So as part of my analysis, I just want to give you a little bit of background. What I was doing with the Twitter data was to make my analysis more meaningful. I would take the sources that I would, I would, I would take the content and I was classifying it. I used a standard set of categories for the most frequently occurring pieces of information. So, um, I, and these are a list of, I was figuring out whether the, whether the person or the content came from an individual source. Um, someone within the, an individual within the emergency management community, official information sources around the disaster, mainstream media, news aggregation, social media, or spam, or unknown was the default. So when Chris Erickson called me and she was heading to the Carlton Complex fire, I started a data collection midday on, on uh, July 18th. And at the time, the fire was about 39,000 acres. And later that evening, extreme weather conditions caused the fire to blow up overnight by over 100,000 acres. It ended up being one of the worst fires in Washington state history. In the middle of the night, it burnt through the town, 
Through two towns, Pateros and Twisp, destroying over 300 homes, it knocked out um, power and cellular infrastructure, so there were major communication issues surrounding this fire. Um, and so during the fire, I provided a lot of reporting to the team on the ground, but there was almost no communication between me and the incident management team. So after the fire, I got together with the um, public information officer and her team. And we talked about some of the value that the reports provided. But there was a comment that she made during the discussion that stuck with me. And she said, she told me that she, although she really appreciated the information that I was providing for her, especially in intense incidents, what she really needed to know was what she didn't know, is what she said. And that I know from experience, if I step back and I thought about what a VOST does, a VOST is about providing enough resources to catch the information that might slip through the cracks. And so, and, and it's, very, it's very difficult looking at Twitter. It's easy to find the common stuff. The, there, there are information sources that dominate the conversation. It's really hard looking at the content of a tweet to pick out whether it comes from an individual or a local source, whether it's the stuff they're trying to prevent from slipping through the, the cracks. So I stepped back from that and I started thinking about what I'd done and the work I'd done on the reporting. And my thought was, I wonder if I can take what I've already done and just look at it in a different way. If I, I may not be able to get to the tweets that are coming from those sources, but maybe I can reduce the number of tweets that you look at by excluding sources that I think are unlikely to contain that source of information. So I know from experience with Twitter and disaster that, that information coming from official sources, mainstream media, news aggregators, um, things that we've identified as spam, and then retweet tweets are also redundant information. So my thought was, what can I do? How much can I reduce this? So without changing anything, just using the data that I'd already categorized, in Tableau, I filtered all of that out. And the results were really surprising. So without changing anything, just using the classifications that I'd already done, I was able to eliminate between 82 and 88% of the tweets. And just to give you a perspective on that, this is a graph from the highest volume day of the fire. So when the, when the fire blew up overnight, at 9, 9 a.m. in the morning, all the news media stories hit, and the tweet volume went through the roof. So at that, um, at that highest value point, there were 350 tweets, and I filtered it down to 68 tweets, which is, a one, is doable with one person, which is very significant. So I felt like this was really a, a promising path to go down. But the, the thing that was most striking about it was when I looked at the search results, it was rich in terms of information coming from the ground. And when I did further analysis, about 50% of that was information coming from individual and local sources, which is much better than what we deal with in general. What was also really striking was that often when we're doing social media monitoring, we're looking at pieces of information in isolation. And when you filter out all of the noise, you're able to start connecting what's happening both over time with individuals and interactions between people on the ground. And this is from a fire which there's typically less um, local information that emergency responders value. But as the complexity of these fires grow and another more diffuse events, being able to get to this content could be really important. So knowing that I didn't use a very systematic approach when I did the first analysis, I backed up and I started from a clean data set. And um, I reclassified, so I, I set a, a threshold and I reclassified all sources that occurred at least on average once per day during my time period. And then once I had the data reclassified, I randomly sampled a thousand records from both the tweets that I filtered out, excluding retweets so that it would be similar, um, and then a thousand tweets from the ones that I thought, 
that were high probability of being individual and local. And then I, I analyzed the contents of those tweets. So looking first at the tweets set that I <coughs> sampled from those that were filtered out, first of all, I found no emergency relevant information in that data set. Um, and it was dominated by mainstream media, which is not really a surprise. Um, and the only individual content that I found were typically from the personal accounts of emergency responders. This is an example of a couple <coughs> tweets from that set. And given that it's from within the emergency response community, um, it's information that's known to emergency responders and the, and the VOSC members felt like that's fine to filter out. So then uh, shifting to the individual or to the other data set, individual, looking for individual and local content, right at 50% of them came from individual and local sources. And so I wanted to look at what those tweets contained. So I coded them in terms of what types of content they had and also what scope that information had. So was this content meant for a general audience or was it locally specific? And then within that, was there emergency relevant information? So that's how we broke it down. Um, and looking at this, you can see that the, it was dominated by information sharing. And you can also see with the light blue that a large portion of this was focused on local information. So given these results and knowing that I didn't do it during an incident, I did it post, it was